All right. Tugboat. Yep. Tugboat. Uh, where'd you grow up? Where are you from originally? Uh, Orange County, um, like Yorba Linda area, and then down by the beach, uh, Newport area. What was your family like? It was cool. Uh, single mom. I love her. She's does everything for me, even more than she should. And uh, she left my dad when I was one years old because he uh, like abused her, tried to kill her. Uh, How would you describe your childhood in general? It was better than a lot of other kids. Money uh, was not really an issue. Uh, my mom worked all the time. She may not have been there all the time, but she did what she had to do. So I had a good life up until I was about 13 and started rebelling really bad. You finished high school? I actually got my GED when I was 16 in juvenile hall. So you, you went to I was in juvenile, juvenile yeah. prison instead of finishing school? Yeah, I was there for 11 months. Uh, for a string of uh, burglaries and robbery. Uh, you think not having your dad in your in your life was uh, the reason you kind of took that direction? Yeah, it was also the fact that my dad, my mom told me that my, she married my dad in Chino State Prison back in like uh, 1980 or something like that. And, uh, uh, Man, yeah, uh, she, he was in for murder. Him and a bunch of buddies uh, dropped a concrete block on some dude's head over in Long Beach back in the late 70s. And he had a manslaughter and she ended up marrying him. I guess her dad didn't want her to, but he ended up, I think, going to the wedding on the Chino East Yard in prison. And I ended up on the same yard as him where they got married and she visited me there. And, that's the first time she was there in like, shit, 25 years. You know, 30, probably over that 30 years since she had been there. And it was kind of weird, I think. I don't know, but. So when you got out and you were free, what, what kind of, what'd you get into? Um, so at the beginning of like my shake, uh, criminal career, it was, uh, I was involved in a skinhead gang um, I, um, you know, would, uh, after I got into that gang, you know, uh, I had to do some, uh, things that are, uh, yeah, uh, pr pretty bad to get in there. You know, it wasn't like, uh, the other gangs, like the Mexican gangs, the black gangs, where you get like jumped in. You have to actually go do like, like a shooting or something, you know? something uh, of a random person of a different race, you know, and. Uh, this was in prison? No, this was. On the street. Yeah. And, um, you know, it, it was whatever. So we had to witness it. And uh, it was kind of stupid looking back on it now, like having somebody witness a crime like that, you know, but uh, I, you know, did what I did, and then I went to prison for uh, like burglaries mostly. Uh, even though what I did a lot of was sell drugs back then and uh, robberies and stuff, but most of them were like drug dealers I would rob or people that I know would have money like in their houses and stuff. You know, like a lot of foreigners have shoeboxes full of money in their closets because they don't believe in bank accounts. So. Yeah, just a lot of that. Uh, I was always uh, interested in tattooing too, so uh, I started tattooing a lot. Uh, but that really started like after I went to prison for the first time. But I've done like 14 years. The last one I did was uh, I got nine years with 85 for a violent residential burglary, which in hindsight, it really wasn't even violent at all. It's really stupid how it went down. I literally broke into a car in a parking structure, 
and they ended up giving it to me because there was a potential for me going upstairs and, and hurting people. But it, all I did was break into a car and they gave me nine years for it. But that's, I'm grateful for that. Very grateful for that because I actually stayed clean the whole time I was busted and didn't stay, you know, uh, clean off of drugs. I, I was, I actually had dropped out uh, because they gave me uh, my second strike. I didn't want to um, uh, stay in for a long time, you know, because I had potential from the gang that I was in to uh, have to do, you know, put in work, you know, stabbing people. And I've done all, the, all that. I mean, like, when I was active, I just didn't want to do that this time. But, uh, I mean, there was, there was one time in this, this last term that I did at a, a prison up north where they started releasing a bunch of lifers and stuff and granting people parole that uh, had been in for like heinous stuff, like child molesters, man. And they gave this one dude a, a, who was in there for a three, three counts of a lewd acts on a minor. Two of them were under the age of eight. The other one was under the age of 14 and uh, prolonged abuse of a child, uh, of a family member, you know, and, uh, I went to go say something to him and as I picked up the People magazine that was on his table in the day room, his table, he like, he sat there for the year and a half I was there on that yard. Uh, I picked it up and I went, as I went to go say something to him, I opened it and he had made his own like kitty porn, man. Like uh, he would take the pornography of like women in these magazines that would have like, you know, no, no, no boobs, flat, flat chested and, and had uh, like no pubic hair. And he would put pictures of the kids' faces over the, uh, the faces of the models. And he would make, he made his own little child thing. And as I, as I, 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 I grabbed it, I, and I looked at it, he realized that he was, he was fucked, man. <laughs> and uh, I told him to sit there and uh, I waited for chow to start. After I showed my celly, my celly told me, what are you gonna do, man? My celly was an LWAP, uh, life without parole. So there was, there was no chance of getting out. And I told him, man, I'm gonna f kill that dude, man. He's gonna get out there and touch kids, dude. Ruin kids' lives, man. And uh, he said, all right, man, I got your back. So as they opened up all three sides of the 270 building, I was on Seaside and he was our neighbor. He had just actually moved there like a week before. Uh, the door, the doors open. They were not supposed to open all three sections at a time, but the cop there was lazy, you know? So he went like A, B, C, and it opened up all three sections, top and bottom tier. And as he looked over at the A side, because the other cops were in the chow hall, I went in with the ice pick and I kicked him back onto the table in the back of the cell and I stabbed him 28 times in the head with the ice pick. And I went into the other cell and I, Gave the shirt to my celly and I went to chow, put another shirt on and four hours passed. And uh, uh, since, since it happened and nobody had seen it, they didn't count and they had found him. So they did knuckle checks on everyone and you know got the detectives or whatever ISU in there. And they, uh, they uh, had been told by like somebody in another cell, you know, that uh, the people in one, 143 or 142, whatever cell I was in, I forget, but um, that one of them did it. So as they called me out and my celly out, they put us both in cages and basically told me to shut up in front of him. And they said, uh, Mr. So-and-so, my, you know, my, my celly at the time, who was actually in there for killing his parents, um, back in the nineties or whatever. Right. And it's not the Menendez brothers either, but, uh, just some nerd kid that killed his parents, man. Uh, when he was 19 and he, uh, they told me, they said, uh, Hey, uh, keep your mouth shut. Basically call me by my name and, uh, looked at my celly and said, Hey man, we know, we know what happened here. Are you going to say what happened here? Like, we're going to tell you how to say what happened here. And I'm looking at my cell and he's looking at me. And he's like, uh, what happened? He said, uh, he came at you and you, you, you stabbed him, right? I mean, you had to, he had a knife, right? He said, you're LWAP. Uh, it's just mutual combat. 
with a with a with a death attached to it uh we'll get you six months in the shoe but we'll we'll uh give you a uh i don't know what the word is like a uh a stay of not a stay of execution but you know like um oh uh all you have to do is a week and they'll give you like a suspended sentence of the shoe, right? So what you're saying is the correctional officer is kind of- Oh, look, look absolutely out, covered it up. They knew, I mean, this dude, they were pissed that he was going home too. I mean, I worked as a, as a, as a, uh, in the, in the clerk's office, you know? Sex offenders just have it so rough. <laughs> yeah, I, there's, I mean, fuck scum, man. I have three kids, man, I don't- They, they don't have a chance yeah, <laughs> from, no. the, from the- fellow inmates to the to the correctional officers they're they're doomed no actually you know what they get treated better than most other inmates in there they do yeah by the cops because they're they're afraid of uh lawsuits and stuff oh i see yeah it's sick it's really sick but yeah so you know in that that was just one incident you know he ended up coming back to the yard like a week later and we were sellies again for about six more months and then i dropped down uh another level and uh they told me uh they said, um, you know, uh, uh, we're gonna send you to a program your last five months here, uh, but the program's on the streets. So I ended up doing a program, but the whole time I had stayed clean off of drugs, right? And uh, I wanted to become a, a drug counselor. And um, I ended up uh, doing that when I got out for a little bit, I got married to a girl that I had met 16 years before on the internet back when MySpace was a thing. And uh, after a month of talking, we got married. I moved her out here and um, she ended up getting cancer. And uh, she wanted to spend the rest of her life for the love of her life. And that wasn't me, it was her ex. Uh, but that was, all right, I know what love is. Love is love. I have a strong love for my baby mama. She's, we both done prison terms for each other. Uh, she's just as gangster as I am, sometimes more. <laughs> and uh, she's actually one of the other reasons why I had to drop out because I have kids of mixed race. And uh, I got shot for that and stabbed by my own um, comrades, you know, but I never told on, on anyone about anything like that. And uh, I just went off right when I got to prison, just went straight to the yard. So I didn't have to uh, tell on anybody or roll it up from a yard. Because if you're on an active yard and you go to drop out, you have to like debrief. You have to tell everybody what they did or you have to tell on a crime in there to get out of there. Yeah. But yeah, so she, she, sorry, I'm jumping everywhere, but she ended up moving back to the, the East Coast and went with her ex-boyfriend that she loved so much as she's fighting her cancer, but he ended up leaving her for <laughs> his baby mama because, you know, karma's a bitch. <laughs> but <laughs> I still talk to her. We're still married. She's still fighting the cancer. She actually, uh, she had gotten a kidney transplant before the cancer. That's why she got the cancer is because of her anti-rejection pills. And uh, she ended up um, getting a rare or some crazy bone cancer that went from like the size of a pea to the size of like a softball in her rib in like a month. It was crazy. But I ended up uh, relapsing. This is after I was a drug counselor for a year, uh, a little over a year, and I, I had worked in uh, rehab down here in uh, in uh, by Skid Row around here, right around here. And uh, I ended up starting getting high while I was working there. And uh, man, it was just, I, I, I told myself I wasn't gonna be doing anything I was doing before. And I wasn't really doing anything like that. And then I started doing stuff like that. And I met, uh, I met a loan shark and a couple of dealers. And I told them, hey man, I could do some collections, you know? They're like, yeah, are you really about that life? And I'm like, just give me someone. And uh, one of the loan sharks gave me a uh, 
$150, let's say, case, right? $150 case I took on, right? I get paid half of whatever the uh, the amount is, right, that they get owed. So, and sometimes there, there's a few drug dealers that would be like, hey, here's, just take it all, man. Just, just, just go, just go get where it's supposed to be, right? Or what's supposed to be paid. So uh, this loan shark gives me $150 case, my first one. And uh, I had this uh, South African um, dude that I had met, uh, call him uh, Fabian. And, uh, little dark skin, you know, black guy from South Africa, you know, that we look like a weird cr duo, you know, a weird team, but it worked and he listened and I told him, you want to make money? Come with me. He had just come over here and I was, he had gotten robbed by four Asians and got beat up. That's why I took him under my wing because he was really fucked up by the, by the robbery. And, uh, so we went to this dude's house and, uh, Man, I had this 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 hatchet, right? That I always carried around with a sheath that was attached to my belt, and uh, and a gun, a nine millimeter uh, Glock. And uh, I go there and I knock on the door and I say, "Hey, uh, I know Bob. We'll call him Bob. Hey, Bob, uh, I need to talk to you for um, let's say uh, Tom. Tom's the." Uh, We'll say Tom is the uh, loan shark, right? I said, hey, Tom sent me to talk to you real quick, man. And I'm like, don't don't fight it, dude. I'll kick in your fucking door. You know, and he lets me in. And he's like, he starts off like a little shaky and everything. And then he like got some balls somehow, like all of a sudden. And he starts talking shit. And he's like, he's like, you know, what are you going to do with that gun? You look like a big old bitch. You know, I'm like, well, I'm not a bitch. I know I'm not a bitch. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, so I fucking told Fabian to hold his hand. And he's like, what are you going to do, fucking shoot me? And I'm like, no, man, I'm going to cut off his fucking finger. And I took the hatchet out and I cut off his fucking pinky. And he, like, cut through his whole, his whole pinky fucking flew onto the kitchen floor. And it was, like, halfway through his other finger, too. And I told Fabian, grab the finger. And he threw it in the garbage disposal. And I flipped the switch and... You know, and I told him, 150 bucks, dude, you lost your fucking pinky, man, because you're a fucking smart mouth, you know? And he's just he's stupid. Like, he could have died over that if I was, like, even worse than what I am, you know? But it went on like that, you know? I mean, there was a couple other ones that were, had to end in violence, but most of the time I gave people chances, you know? I even let people off, man. You just give me, like, 40 bucks, you know, if you owe, if you owe like a few hundred, 500 or so, and I would just, you know, let them off with a couple hundred bucks. And I just give the, the people what they were owed and not even take it if I like them, if, if I thought they were sincere, you know, it's all about how people respond to people, I guess you could say, you know, and what is the weapon you'll use? Is it a gun or a knife or a bat or what? what you... I, I always had a gun or have, you know, not, not really anymore. I don't really do this no more. Not that aspect of it, but um, you could say hatchet or uh, I have a big uh, Bowie knife. Like it looks like a Rambo knife. It's about that big and uh, it's heavy, it's like five pounds. I mean, it's like seriously heavy. And uh, it may or it may have not cut off a couple hands or fingers in its time. This is Orange County or this is LA that you? Uh, this is, in, actually, I, I've, I'll take them, uh, I've taken them in Orange County, LA County. Uh, the ones that had to go a little violent were more out in, San Bernardino Riverside area. One of them was actually on an Indian reservation. I don't really want to talk about that one, but that was, uh, yeah. I mean, if, if I look at it as if you owe, you owe. I've even do, done collections for uh, bondsmen, or bonds, bondsmen or whatever. Uh, one bonds company guy that I know, uh, he would give me cases and stuff. 
I call them cases and I told him I'm not going to tell the, the cops or anything where these people are, but I'll go get the money for you. And I go and get the money or the collateral they're owed one way or another, you know? Yeah. That's, uh, I mean, I, I've caught two cases for one of the loan sharks that I, uh, that I uh, work for. I'm fighting one now, so I won't really talk about that one. But uh, another one I had, he literally sent me to go move a trailer that some dude owned. And he told me to move it two blocks away or a block away and that he wanted to scare the guy. So I went over there, hooked it up to my truck, moved it. And two months later, I get pulled over randomly in a city over in Huntington, or in a, uh, like Huntington Beach area, but it wasn't Huntington Beach though. It was like over there, Fountain Valley or something, right? And uh, I think it was Fountain Valley actually. And uh, I get pulled over and I don't know why these cops pulled me over. I'm in the truck and they're like talking to me and I'm like, I'm telling them like, yeah, I mean like, I don't know, I'm just going, uh, I was actually going to sell a firearm <laughs> that I had made uh, out of um, a, a uh, I think it's called a Ram set. It's like a, uh, you can buy them at Home Depot. They're like a 22 caliber gun that uh, shoots uh, a nail, like a hammer, but it's like a two 22 caliber, but I, I make them into single shot 22 caliber gun basically with uh, without even like doing massive work to it. They're fairly easy to turn into a single shot. And they're very, very, very reliable. A little, a little random of where it goes, but it's usually about a foot area of where it'll hit, you know? And uh, I was going to go sell it. And they didn't even catch that, by the way, when they were searching my car. But anyways, they were telling me, right? They were like, they were like, hey, what are you doing here? And all of a sudden, one of them comes up with a thing, I thought they were gonna let me go. And they're like, hey, I just wanna know one thing. And he brings out this fucking laptop, I'll never forget it. And he's like, why'd you only move the car a block away and leave it? Or the trailer, right? And I'm like, let me see that. And I look at it and, and the truck looked like it was black and my truck was blue. And I'm like, that's not, that's not me, my, that, my truck's blue, this one's black. He's like, oh, hold on. And he goes to the next frame and it's lighter and it's, <laughs> A fucking picture of me next to my blue truck wearing the same fucking shirt that I'm wearing at that time, two months later, this red shirt. And I'm like, what the fuck can I say? Cause I'm caught. <laughs> I feel like a fucking dumbass. And uh Fabian was in the car with me, and he has a warrant. He's going to jail for something that he like did right when he got here. He got arrested for some misdemeanor and he was telling me how he needed uh, to get rid of it anyway, so I guess he's going to jail to get rid of it, you know? And I'm sitting there awestruck that these people, this fucking cop, man, like, I hate cops, man. I got fuck cops tattooed on my ass. When they strip search me, like, it literally says fuck cops on each, like, one cheek is fuck, four inch layers, the other one says cops. And they know when they're like, bend over, I, they know how I feel, you know? And, uh, and this fucking cop, man, he, he was so cocky. And that motherfucker got me, man. He fucking, he was like, why'd you only move it a block away? And I, I had no answer. All I said was things, I, I, I had to think of something quick, right? To say, I said, the answer to your questions can only be answered if the time is right or some shit like that. And he probably thought I was a crackhead or something, man. Like, I just couldn't think of anything to say. And fucking, yeah, man, they got me. And I ended up, going because of my extensive uh, background you know uh, uh criminal background man they they never do uh in arraignments in county jail they never give you a deal the first one right the arraignment they never do but i was the last one in the fucking line that day man so they never they never like give you a deal on your arraignment and i've never been last in line to go get arraigned before and i've done like like i said 14 years plus including juvenile, probably like 16 years, man. I'm 35, turning 30, 36, and I'm, I'm literally like, 
done uh, almost more than half, about half my life in, in jail, man, in prison, you know? And uh, I was actually kind of freaked out about it, man, because I've never been last. And it's just some stupid misdemeanor too, man. And but I didn't want to go back. I got PTSD from prison, man. It's not even like, it's not even because of things I did or seen in prison. It's just the feeling of, of not having control of my situation or my life. It, it, it left me with night terrors of like my mom dying or something like that because I couldn't get a hold of her while I was in prison this time. Uh, because she was in the hospital, I just lost my stepdad, and it was just a really bad time in my life right there. And uh, I ended up having night terrors still to this day. Uh, I'll wake up crying, or some song or something will trigger me, and I have like a full blown panic attack. And my mom knows about it. And I tell her why I have it, and uh, it's not. It's really not for anything I've done. It's just. I just don't want to lose my mom, you know, and because uh, she's been there. But um, yeah, I don't know. What's your biggest regret? <sighs> Not being there for my kids. Yeah. How many kids? Um, three. I come there now. I was like on the phone. My son, he was born four months after I got busted. Yeah. Yeah, he was premature. He was like one or one pound, six ounces. He was teeny. No baby mama. I like had him almost four, four and a half months early. But uh, he would like talk to me all the time on the phone or whatever, you know? He'd always say, are you happy? It's like, are you happy? Tattooed on my head <laughs> with a question mark. But yeah. What's your, big, what's your biggest fear? at this point in your life? Getting life in prison or um, uh, losing my mom. Yeah. That's what they are. Those, those two. I mean, my kids, of course, but uh, I talk to them. Or I see them on the weekends and stuff. Even though I'm homeless right now. I've never been homeless in my life. I go to a homeless shelter, try and get a voucher. And they kick me out for two weeks. And I've been out for like a month and a half now, homeless, on the streets. Doing shit that I don't want to do. Selling drugs. and Are you using? Yeah, yeah, uh, fentanyl, man. I've actually gone down from about three grams to about a dime a day, which was really hard to do because I was a heroin addict. That's my, that's my thing. I, I liked heroin and speed. But speed, I already know, puts me in prison. I used to shoot up like a gram of speed at a time and literally I've run from like my drug dealing business partner and two blocks in my boxers with a nine millimeter because I did a gram and a half shot and fucking, I look at her and I'm like, there has to be somebody at my house right now breaking in. And fucking, she's like, what are you talking about? Just fuck me. And I'm like, no, bitch, I'm going to go run over to my house. And I grab a gun and I go run over to my apartment fucking two blocks away. And she's like driving after me, like, just get in the car. And I'm like, there's somebody there. And it was, yeah, it was, it was like the last time I shot up. <laughs> before I started shooting up again. Not this time though, I don't shoot up now. Nah, I shit fucking, I, I, I did for a little bit. I t actually took, a, when I relapsed, I, I uh, it literally went from like one Norco one day to the next day I'm like, fuck it, I'm gonna shoot up some heroin. So me and my buddy of a long time were like, let's get some heroin. He's like, all right. 
He's like, but we can't do it after today. And I'm like, don't trip, dude, I'm good. Yeah, and then I did it for like a week and a half, two weeks. And then all of a sudden my dealer was like, look, dude, you just had eight years clean. You're a drug counselor working at rehab. I'm not gonna sell it to you anymore. And I'm like, bro, I gotta have it. Don't start loving me now, dude, right? Like, don't fucking love me now, dude. Let's give me some fucking heroin, man. And he's like, no. So that night I went and drove over one block away from my work at this bougie, bougie rehab center where there's a bunch of homeless people at. And I walked up to one and I said, hey man, uh, or I actually I drove up to him and he was walking. And I didn't want to seem like some creep or, you know, I'm not ho- homophobic at all, but I, I walked up and I said, hey, uh, hey bro, uh, roll down my list. Not on some fag shit, but do you have some, uh, some drugs or do you fuck around? And he's like, what do you do? And I'm like, black, you know, heroin. And he looked at me like I said the N word, like 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 heroin was like outlawed and it was like horrible shit. He's like, Oof. nobody does that anymore. It's fentanyl now. And I'm like, what the fuck is fentanyl? Cause I just done like eight years. I, I thought it was like, you touched it, you die, you know? And he's like, nah, man, I'm gonna sit here in this car with you. You're gonna take one hit of this stuff, man. You're gonna feel like you shot up a half, half gram of fucking black. And I said, you're a fucking liar. No friend of Jesus, dude. He's like, no, I'm not. And he fucking took one hit. He told me he had Narcan. I took one hit. I'm like, you know, I'm not going to need it. I didn't need it, but man, it was like heaven in a big, warm, fuzzy blanket with every dog that I had that died before all around me, cuddling me. It was awesome. And it was very stupid because I've lost a lot of people that I know from fentanyl before. And, uh, I was gonna stay clean for my, for myself, and you know, I, I have my brother. He had just passed from a, from a Huntington's disease, and uh, and uh, COVID actually killed him. They said, but he was holding on longer than he was supposed to when I got out, and I actually got to talk to him and make amends with him before he died over uh, iPad, or whatever the hell it's called, the video call talk, thing, and. Uh, take some video pictures of him and he, he can barely talk or whatever, but yeah, he, uh, fuck man, I'm gonna cry again. <sighs> yeah, man. Yeah, man, he fucking love, love him, man. I feel bad for fucking up. You trying to cut back just, just to get clean as yeah. a goal? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not even doing close to anything I was doing, like at all. Like I'm very, very, doing very little. And I actually spaced it out myself because I know that like it's harder to detox from from this stuff. So like I'll go like a day and a half, two days in between using to uh, really like wean it off, you know? I'm, I'm almost done. I'd say I'll be done in a week or so. That's why I actually came out here, man. Cause my other brother is just got clean and he, I need to get out of the area that I was in. So now I'm out here in uh, motel, hotel, whatever the hell it is. But it's cool. Met some good people already. And I'm not, I, I always tell everybody I'm a dropout, you know, because I don't feel like I should um, hide it. I'm not trying to like slip and slide or fucking like try to if i if i know somebody i'm not going to disrespect them by being like because i still got respect for gang members and shit you know i mean weird street street respect you know not like like oh you're a great person but like you know like like you know like i was there man i I respect the game whatever you're gonna do you're gonna do man right but it's like this i don't want you fucking up your career criminal career but you know your career because you're talking to me right i want to give you the chance to know like Hey, bro, I'm a dropout. I, 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 I'm not a snitch. I ain't no fucking weirdo, you know? I got in trouble because my fucking kids are different colors and my fucking comrades decided to call them spicks or whatever the fuck they wanted to call them, right? And fucking start this issue because of my fucking kid's mom is Salvadorian, you know? And uh, they shouldn't even tell me who I love or who I can't love, you know? Or, and those are my kids. You're, if I'm your homeboy or your comrade, you're supposed to love me and my family, you know? Well, you call my kids, you know, spicks or whatever, right? I, I hate race. I'm not even, 
I'm not even racist, man. Like, I don't even know why I was a skinhead anyways. Like, I'm, 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 I'm like, uh, I converted to Judaism. I'm a freaking Jew now. Like, legit. Like, like, Jew, like, like I did everything I had to do to become a Jew, you know? Uh, uh, yeah, man. For what reason? Huh? For what reason? Um, because it's the only religion that really makes sense to me, really. Uh, I don't believe in Jesus. I don't, you know, I, I, uh, I don't believe somebody died for my sins. Like that means like, like just if, uh, like, like let's go back to child molesters, basically a child molester could touch all these kids and all of a sudden he takes this dude, Jesus is like, um, you know, uh, uh, this is my blood and this is my, 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 my body thing. And like, I died for your sins. Nah, man, you fucking touch kids. You're going to hell, motherfucker. You know? You have to atone for your own sins. And that's why I, I, I don't, I, I just believe in God. God is God. Not that he's come back with some dude riding a donkey or nothing like that, man. Like, he's just, you know, it's, it's, it's a big thing, man. Like, I, I just can't believe in Jesus. He just does not sit with me, right? And my mom's always like, you gotta be a good Christian. And I'm like, you were getting tarot card readings last week. Don't talk to me about good Christianity. No, I love my mom, but you know, we always have some bickering thing because she loves Trump and I hate politicians. It's just whatever, man. It's like all these fucking wannabe skinheads and shit. Fucking want to love Trump because he's like white power or whatever the fuck, man. I don't even care, man. I just hate politicians. No rot in hell. Anarchy. <laughs> Talk about what would you say is the most important lesson you've learned in your life? Um, man, that's a hard one. I don't, I don't, I, um, you know, it's, I don't know, I don't really know. Like, I mean, like, keep it honest. I, I try to keep it honest as I can with everybody. But yet again, I lie a lot to people, you know, that I love really. It's the people I love the most I lie to about stuff, you know? Um, but they see through the bullshit anyways. I can't lie. My mom knows I'm fucking lying or I'm lying. And I'm sitting there straight lying to her over the phone. Cause like I have a new gambling addiction now and I fucking like, I put off fentanyl and it's like gambling comes up and like, it's going great right now, but fuck, I'm gonna lose. I'm winning like 500 bucks a day, basically sometimes, you know, and just blowing it on fucking buying stuff for a bunch of homeless people where I was. I'd go buy a whole bunch of food and cook food for them. And it started to get to the point where like, I felt like I was in prison again because like people, the white kids are like having like disputes with each other and looking to me for guidance. And I'm like fucking shot calling again for no fucking reason. And like, I'm like, it happened the other day. And I'm like, well, if you guys are gonna fight, you gotta fight, but he has a fucked up hand. So make sure that you're only fighting with one hand too, because you guys are supposed to be fucking homeboys. And I'm like, what the fuck am I doing? I don't even care that much of, like about that issue. like. I don't know. I, I, honestly, I have a really good heart and I help a lot of people out. But if you fuck over my friends or people that I work for, I don't care. Unless you're a woman. I don't touch women. I don't touch kids. I think that women beaters are the same thing as fucking rapists to me. They'll never change. Just because my dad, he, he's trying to make amends though. He really is. This last time in prison, it's because he, he knows he's dying. Maybe not right away, but years of meth and alcohol. He has cirrhosis in the liver and, you know, he's just falling apart. And I just still don't answer the phone a lot, man. It's still like, he's trying so hard, man. Like, it's like everything like I should want, but it's like, oh, motherfucker. No, I'm the one not answering the phone, you know? I'm not gonna be there for all your birthdays and shit, you know? It's what it is, man. I love who I love and I don't love who I don't. It's all right. 
Tugboat, thank you so much for sharing your story. Uh, yeah, thank you. I wish you lots of luck from here. Yeah, cool, Thanks, man. Man.